You're listening to The Dental Guys, the AO Annual Meeting Preview with special guest, President Dr. Tara Agalu. This week on The Dental Guys, John and I interview the President of the Academy of Osseo Integration, Dr. Tara Agalu. We discuss what is going on in the state of education and dentistry. We discuss zirconia implants. Dr. Tara Agalu is an expert, and we bring up some controversial questions, and she uh, covers those things for us. And then, to boot, we discuss the 2022 AO Annual Meeting in San Diego, California, where the dental guys will be covering it. We're excited about this podcast with Dr. Agalu, so stay tuned this week on The Dental Guys. When the dental guys need an infection prevention product, we turn to Kerr and their Total Care line. Kerr has been an industry leader in infection control and prevention products for years. And when we think of infection control, cavicide and cavi wipes are the first things that come to our minds. It's automatic and there's a reason for that. Kerr knows dentistry and their products work. The dental guys trust Kerr products in our offices and you should too. Stay safe with Kerr Total Care. Looking for a lab that understands the bridge between art and science? Check out the Dental Crafters Network. Dental Crafters, one relationship, infinite possibilities. Contact them at 1-800-472-8302 or at dentalcrafters.net. Do you want to learn to predictably place and restore dental implants using the most modern science and technology? We are talking 60 hours of CE in a comprehensive curriculum and live surgical implant placement on pre-selected patients. Head over to RestorativeDrivenImplants.com to learn more today. And we are back with the Dental Guys uh, jointly re- uh, presenting this with the Academy of Austin Integration. And we are here with Dr. Tara Agalu. So let's bring her on the show. Welcome, Dr. Agalu. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me. Really excited to be here. We're excited too. The last one of the last lectures that I got to see live was actually your lecture, University of Tennessee. Ooh. This was back in 2019, back before the world ended or seemed like it was ending, uh, <laughs> and uh, you came and talked. And we're going to be kind of coming back to that, circling back to some of the research-based topics. One of the reasons why we love the academy is because of some of the things we get to talk about. Uh, with with the science and and the nuts and bolts, so we're going to be circling back to that. But super excited to have you on. And first thing we want to talk about is obviously what's coming up with this academy meeting. It has been a, a long time since we've had a meeting. It seems like forever. And you guys are bringing, I feel like, uh, everything you got here in a good way. You know, we're really pulling out all the stops. You've got some great speakers. We've got a great lineup. Uh, tell us a little bit about some of the things you're excited about for this upcoming Academy of Austin Integration annual meeting. Well, great. I mean, thanks for having me, and I'm super excited to talk about our meeting. I, I agree with you. I think this is going to be the real first meeting back for most people. I mean, there have been some meetings, definitely. I've been to a few that are smaller, but this is the first big blowout, and I'm really excited that it gets to be our AO meeting. Um, I'm, you know, excited about the the title. We are. It's it's really about implants everybody getting involved in implants. We're going to be treasuring the past. We're going to be honoring us, sorry, treasuring the present, honoring the past, and really looking forward to the future. It's really about all of it, you know, where we've come from, what we've learned, what we're all doing now, and what the future holds. And so I think that we put together some great speakers. Um, Herman Gallucci is the program chair, and we've worked really closely with his committee and, you know, our industry partners and other organizations, and really just getting everything going and prepared for February. So, you know, we really couldn't be more excited and and ready to see everyone in person. I mean, I think the you know, the meeting's going to be awesome and the speakers are going to be great and the program's going to be nice. But I think most people are really excited for the social events and um, all the camaraderie and the colleagues that they haven't seen for two years. So I think that that it's OK that, um, you know, that we're more, you know, at least as much looking forward to seeing 
meeting each other really are the meeting. And, and I'm okay with that. I think that everyone's going to have a special reason to come to the meeting. And while I think a lot of it is, is honestly the science, the innovation and the, the clinical pearls that you'll, that you'll get from being there, I really think people are going to be excited to see each other. And with that, we've just created some awesome social events that, that people will be really excited about. The title of the, of the meeting this year is Implant Dentistry for All. Tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about that title and what's going to be done to kind of culminate that and bring that to light at the meeting. Well, we really want everyone to get excited about implant dentistry, whether you're a general practitioner, a specialist, an allied staff, whether it's lab technician, hygienist, implant coordinator, assistant, student, postgraduate, um, resident. We really want everybody to, to come and get involved, researchers, everyone. And so we want to to honor the past and really where we started and, and how far that we've come in implant dentistry. You know, what makes it so successful? How do we continue to innovate? What are we doing now in the industry? Where are we with um, soft tissue and, and hard tissue grafting, with implant um, immediate loading and um, surfaces and, and really all of the, the different things that we're doing now in terms of, of techniques and technology. And then where are we going in the future? Um, what kind of business models and practice models are we going to have? How do things of the future, such as artificial intelligence and other things, I mean, how does all that come into play? And so I, I think that there will be something for everyone at this meeting. And so I, I encourage everyone to come and, and I think they will. I mean, the, the response that we've been getting around the country and around the world has just been amazing. And everyone's really excited as, as am I, as maybe you can tell, I mean, I can tell you guys are excited and you could probably tell that I'm super excited yeah, too. Absolutely. We, you know, we were uh, slated for the last meeting in Seattle to, we were going to be speaking there. And so we're able to record that, you know, and do that online, which was still super cool, honored to be able to do. And we, and it was, it, this sounds like such a, a crazy thing for those who, who didn't get to see it, but before COVID hit, right, Wes and I had had this discussion that we were going to present on is, you know, online education or, or online meeting uh, space the, the the wave of the future or is it really that you know that, that this could take away from the profession this was before everything really changed and I think that while we've we've gotten so much from the change in in terms of things being presented online and being able to get so much great content that you alluded to this early on in this in this discussion that just seeing each other, and being able to be face to face and sitting in a room and listening to some of the, the great speakers that we'll have, there is something about it. There is something about it. And that's what Wes and I kind of uncovered. We talked to some experts on, you know, how people process information and, and really learn complex subjects and talk about, you know, problem solving. And, and there's sometimes no replacement for not only the, the in person, not, I'm not saying it's, you can't do a lot without it, but there's something about the coffee break. Right. There's something about the, you know, the, the social side of it, of coming together at the end of the day, you know, having a drink with with your friends and saying, hey, what do you think about that implant? What do you think about that technique? Is that is that what you're seeing? You know, because that's an, that's either not what I'm seeing or that is what I'm seeing. Or what are they doing in Germany? Or what are they doing in Sweden? You know, speak to that a little bit as to the value of the in-person, you know, what, why should people come to this meeting? Because I think we've gotten in this groove a little bit of just, you know, oh, well, we'll just take it in from our couch, you know? So, so what, what do you, what do you feel about that? What is, what does this meeting bring? Is there a value in that, in that in-person side? Oh, that's a great question. I mean, I think that we, you're right, we have learned. And I think when we were probably, you know, six months or maybe a little more into COVID, I said, you know, I wonder if meetings are going to change and if we'll do much more online. But and I think there are some things that we can do, you know, maybe um, face to face meetings in a small group or something like that, I think are great. But these big meetings have been really missed. And, and it's not the same. And 
one of the things that, you know, I'm sure that, you know, I'm definitely guilty of is, is multitasking, is tasking when I'm on an online meeting. Sometimes, you know, I probably shouldn't let any of my bosses hear that because uh, they want to know that I'm paying full attention all the time with what I'm doing. But when you're online, you sort of think, well, I can, I can check my email at the same time, or I can do something else at the same time. And, and so I don't know that we're, I, I definitely feel that I'm not as creative at a meeting and I'm not really thinking of, well, how can I, you know, take what I've learned from this lecture and, and apply it to, you know, either my clinical practice or a new research question or something. It's really that interaction and that being there, being able to go up to the speaker afterwards and talk to him or her about that and, and generating these new ideas and, and the dialogue. And that's definitely missed. And, and I know that that's something that that we all really cherish and and even more so now because we haven't done it for so long. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that that's that's the thing that I was hoping you would say. You know, I think that people <laughs> feel that way like you say. I mean, I don't care who you are, you know, when you are plugged in, you can have the best speaker in the world, uh, the most, you know, accomplished clinician but when it's a especially pre-recorded video, or even if it's not, even if it's live, it's difficult. There's something about the accountability, and that's what Wes and I kind of talked about, the accountability of being in a room where, you know, the way you react and the way you interact um, is seen and and you kind of have to engage, or why are you there? You know, right? Like if you're there, you should, you know, you want to be engaged because that's that's the whole idea. Uh, you know, I wonder, I think about you know, dental school, uh, obviously, you know, you're the Dean at the dental school there and, um, have been involved in education for many years. And I, I wonder, as we kind of talk about this topic and what is that, tell us a little bit about what's happening from a dental education side and that same realm, you know, the same things we're excited about with the meeting, you know, obviously the return back to in-person classes and something we never thought we'd be talking about, you know, post the post COVID era. You know, what have, what have you learned? What are some of the things that you're doing there at UCLA? What are some things that you're seeing in the dental education community that are changing as, as a result of COVID? And how do you feel that's going to shape the future of education? Well, I mean, that's a great question, too. I, I mean, we were, you know, obviously in lockdown and the students weren't coming in for quite some time. And so all of the lectures were pre-recorded. We had small group sessions, um, but our students early on, I think they were okay with it and they were kind of happy to go home and, and have a break and still be able to learn. And, and I think that at first they really liked it. You know, oh, I have, it's, it's forcing a lot of my professors to put their materials online and give us something pre-recorded that, you know, they could watch it like one and a half to two times speed and get through it faster, of course. But um, but they they really liked going back and being able to watch something again and 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 do that. So I think it was great in that way. I mean, as someone myself who often you know didn't um, put my whole PowerPoint available online, I would make a PDF instead of um, for the students, or I would always want them to be in the class lecture. I wasn't really excited about just putting my lecture notes up or whatever. And so now, obviously, we've adapted to that, and and all of us, um, even maybe the late adapters or the people who aren't so tech savvy, have now been able to do it. You know, we all can record on Zoom or Voice over PowerPoint, and and the students really like that. However, um, they really miss the the in person interactions, and I think it's kind of worked in in two ways. Um, I direct the surgery track program for all students that are interested in oral surgery here at UCLA. And I started back, you know, a few at a time in our clinic where they could spread out and do some more kind of hands-on skills and discussions in groups. You know, they learned how to draw blood on each other and start IVs and um, suture and and those kind of things. And, and, you know, from the first years to the fourth years, and they just loved that. I mean, you know, they, they weren't really getting to have any other interaction other than that. And so they could, you know, with masks on and social distancing, they could see each other and they could, you know, interact and, and ask questions and we could talk about things. And, and so that was, was really fun. And I said, you know, this is really missed, even though um, I think the students like having all of their, their materials that they can refer to, they, they missed that. 
The other thing I think it did is it sort of made us expect more from the students because if we're giving the lectures beforehand and they have this pre-recorded and then maybe we're meeting in a small group discussions, we're expecting that they've read the material and they've gone through it mm -hmm. and now we're having a more high level discussion. And I think that if that works and if that's what we're doing, then that's a great use of, you know, um, our, our Zoom or pre-recorded lectures. But a lot of times they're really busy or life gets in the way or maybe they're thinking about it like it's a little time off rather than, you know, studying. And, and so then a few times I find that maybe they're not as prepared as I would have liked them to be, especially because we did provide the materials ahead of time. So it's sort of, I think it's a balance. You know, there are some things I think that have improved and, and I think there are some things that maybe we all miss from, from the in-person. One of the things that's interesting about dentistry is that the didactic knowledge <clears throat> is immediately paired with practical hands-on uh, application. And we know that uh, four years, sometimes uh, what we need to know crammed into four years just as a, you know, a DDS or DMD program, it just seems like maybe it's not enough time. And... Um, what I like to hear you say is what John and I kind of discovered during our research of what seemed to be working, right, in education, which was what you described as what we call the hybrid model. Mm -hmm. This hybrid model of education is core knowledge is kind of uh, consumed via maybe online or away from a lectern situation. Um, or even in a classroom situation, maybe it's digested on your own time. But then once that core knowledge has been disseminated um, in, in that form, then collaboration happens. And like you said, it's almost expecting more of the students mm -hmm. because when you arrive, okay, now it's time. We've, we've got the core knowledge. Now it's time to get down to how do we apply this, right? And yeah. what is the critical thinking skills, right? Because I feel like dentistry is an activity of critical thinking all the time. And it's taking that didactic and applying it through your hands and your eyes and critically thinking as you're going. Speak to that. How is it working? Are you looking at taking and changing maybe education, really? I think that's the question I have because... We've been talking about our educational model for some time on our show, and we're excited to see what's to come because of what we were forced to do last year. Because Yeah, is it, it going to change it forever, or are we going to yeah. see it essentially go back to where we were? You know, is this a long-lasting change with, mm -hmm. this, with the online preparation and then the critical thinking in the classroom? We're really interested to hear your thoughts on that. I really think it is because – the students want to have more of their own time and they don't want to be micromanaged and we don't want to micromanage them either. Right. I mean, when you're in professional school, you really have to expect a specific sense of responsibility and that the students are going to learn these things and go through them on their own because they're going to be practitioners in a few short years. Right. So if they're not doing it now as professional students, how can we be sure that they're going to do that when they're in their own practices? We have to be confident that when um, a practitioner sees a patient with a disease that maybe is newer that they didn't learn about in school or are on some new medication, that they're going to go and know where to get the resources and go over it on their own and then come back to the patient, right? So I think that starting to enforce those things now is really important so that it will set up those types of learning models forever. Because in the profession that we're in, no matter if you're a general dentist or the most highly trained specialist that went to a million years of school, um, you're still gonna have to learn things later on. And so we have to have that ability to do that and to figure out where to get the right info, you know, that we're not going to Wikipedia for, um, right. no offense to Wikipedia, but, uh, but that we're not going to a, a super non-scientific uh, place to get our information that we're then going to turn around and use on a patient. Well, that's cool. It sounds like you're, you're yeah. leveraging, you know, kind of the best of, of both, you know, the, the idea that we can have this vast, 
you know, storehouse, if you will, online mm. of a ton of just basic knowledge and, you know, things that are memorization, things that are, you know, basics that we can just say, hey, this is, you know, you have to, you have to memorize the following terms in order to understand just so you can speak correctly about mm. the discussion we're about to have, use the proper terminology. But then when it comes to the discussion, it's still the same thing we've been doing for thousands of years. It's, you know, coming to the classroom and discussing and debating um, and citing and having a backing for what you think about things and having that be challenged. But it is, it's interesting to hear you say that it's more of an independence, you know, idea that there's more, there's maybe less micromanaging that comes out of that. And, and there is a little bit of a generational thing to that. And we could, we could dive into that super far, which we won't mm -hmm. because it's a whole different discussion, but it's interesting that that, you know, whether it's for good or bad, that's debatable, you know, on, on, mm -hmm. on micromanaging, whether it truly is micromanaging or whether it's just, you know, a difference in how we feel about the, the way we're, we're being managed. It depends on probably when I you were I educated. I think I needed to be a little more, I needed to be a little more micromanaged. I'm not sure that I would have been as great <laughs> with in right. school as I was if I wasn't micromanaged. It's easy to think, and I mean, right, you probably have some students listening to this, they're like, I, I don't need, that. you know, I think mm -hmm. we all maybe thought that when we were a certain point in our lives, you know, and then you realize, you know, again, you don't, you don't know what you think, you know, YouTube is, has been har a little bit harmful in the mm -hmm. end, when it comes to the underestimation of what, of how quickly we can learn something, you know, it's a little, oh, yeah. little bit more difficult than a two minute video on how to take out thirds. Right. Oh my so God. I, our I, residents and students are watching YouTube before they do a procedure. And I'm like, Oh my God, we should probably be like looking at those and making sure they're doing it right before they, uh, <laughs> yep. learn how to do it from Hear there. it all the time. People are, we, we <laughs> teach some stuff sometimes and people come in and like, Oh yeah, I watched some videos right before I feel real good about this. Okay. You know, let's make mm -hmm. sure we know where this is coming from. So, yep. So let's, let's talk about, I mentioned at the beginning of the show that um, one of the last meetings I went to, or one of, one of the few that was a, a great didactic lecture, you came and spoke at the University of Tennessee Medical Center with Eric Carlson, and mm -hmm. uh, we're talking about, among other things, uh, an update on uh, a very interesting topic to, to many of us, especially in Europe, but I think kind of slowly making its way more and more and more into the U.S. market, which is zirconia implants and mm -hmm. we've talked about this on the show a few times before with a couple of implant manufacturers we've talked about it with some some folks especially out of germany who are doing a lot of innovation in in, in zirconia implants and uh you spoke at that meeting about kind of what your group has been looking at as far as different designs uh and, and I think that it would be a great discussion to have while we have you here because you're not going to get away on this show, on the dental guys, without – we're not just going to ask you what your favorite ice cream flavor is. We actually <laughs> read the journals, and we care about that, and we love this stuff. So, you know, what I'm interested in is, is, is maybe first as we start unpacking this because obviously there's tons of stuff we could talk about. But let's maybe keep it to some of the most common questions that we have or that we talk about. Number one, let's talk about the two kind of main types of zirconia implants. We have one piece and two piece. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, that's, that's a very broad, I get generalization. There's lots of different ideas of what types and different materials and different uh, combinations of zirconia and titanium. But let's just keep it as to one piece and two piece because initially we had mainly one piece zirconia implants. And I think that was mainly for strength discussion and, and reasoning. Um, where are we now? with one piece versus two piece zirconia implants, what success and failure rates are we seeing? And let's maybe define that a little bit. And then maybe we can talk a little bit about application, where you see the applications being, but you know, what, what are some of the types, uh, what are we seeing? Are these working and, and, and what, should, what should we be thinking about these? I mean, absolutely. I think that, you know, when this started, it was kind of just, maybe only for patients who either had some kind of titanium sensitivity or, or perceived titanium sensitivity, or people who just really didn't want any kind of metal um, in their mouths and, and were seeking out this type of implant. And, and for people like that, this was really a, a great option. And, you know, in, in Los Angeles, of course, we have a lot of patients that are more holistic type of patients or really, um, 
have a lot of allergies or are really concerned about having anything metallic. And so those were the types of patients that we were seeing first and, uh, and utilizing these implants on. And, and you're absolutely right. The one piece I think was, was great because it was, you know, pretty early on available. But it, there's some limitations, of course, with that. I mean, the, the placement has to be perfectly spot on. I mean, you really don't have any room for error. You, you can't prep in general. You, you really can't prep the, um, you know, the abutment aspect of it or the top of the implant. And so if your angulation is off, then, you know, that's certainly going to be a problem. And uh, so I, I think that, that that's one thing. I mean, it has to be a cement retained restoration, right? It can't be screw retained if it's one piece. Um, if you're doing multi units with, with the one piece, we were really only doing, you know, no more than two implants for either a two or a three unit um, type of prosthesis because how are you going to parallel a full arch with, um, with the abutments already connected to the implant and, and not being able to use any angulation? Now, uh, maybe if you planned everything guided and everything went perfectly, that might be okay, but, but that's really difficult to do. Um, so I think that the two piece has opened a lot of doors of the major implant companies either have that they manufacture themselves or they either distribute or have acquired um, ceramic implants. And so I think that, you know, all of industry sees that it's a big area that people are interested, practitioners and patients alike. I mean, it really started, I think, in, in our area here as the patients coming and asking about it. And, you know, I don't know if that's how it was in Germany, but I think so. And, and they're definitely one of the biggest uh, users in terms of countries where, um, where ceramic implants are utilized. So are they working? Are they working? I mean, are, what, what, are we, what are we seeing right now? Because early on, there were some failure issues with yeah. certain yeah. studies we saw. What, what are, where are we now? Update us a little bit on that as far as, um, you know, what, what we're seeing as far as success, success rates. Yeah, I mean, the success rates are, are much better than they were with the first and second generation um, types of zirconia implants. I mean, it's it's significantly better. And, and I think that's why, you know, the major implant companies have gotten on board with these because they are seeing that the success rates are very high. You know, if you're looking even at some of the more basic science studies, the um, the interaction between the soft tissue and the and the zirconia material is is significantly improved. Than, um, than when you're looking at titanium. And that's not news to, to really any of us. I mean, our abutments are, are oftentimes and even more these days zirconia than they are titanium now, right? So, you know, we recognize that that soft tissue interaction and um, the lack of inflammation and the better um, color match and, uh, and responses of fibroblasts and keratinocytes and all that are, are excellent. And so, you know, carrying that on from not just the abutment, but then to the implant is also makes a lot of sense. I mean, you know, if you have thin tissue, we're not going to be worried about the, the gray hue showing through if we have a titanium implant versus when we have a zirconia implant. Um, we also are, are thinking a lot about aesthetics. I mean, in, in Los Angeles, the aesthetic zone is third molar to third molar, right? So, uh, <laughs> so everyone, <laughs> everyone's really concerned about aesthetics. And, and I, I think it's hard to, you know, to argue with the fact that in a lot of cases, uh, an implant that's white is going to be more aesthetic than than one that's you know metal or or silver or grayish color, and so I think that that um, that's one one reason definitely, and and the success rates are are definitely higher with the you know with this current generation of um, of zirconia implants, and so we're we're very happy and very confident in them. But you know when patients come and they ask are they as successful as titanium? And, you mm. know, with the limited studies that we have, we can say, yes, how they've been studied, but we certainly haven't been doing them this way, you know, in the current generation as long as titanium. And so I always share that with the patient, you know, we don't have longer than five year data most times. And a lot of studies are even one, only one or two or three year data. Whereas with titanium implants, we have 10, 20, 30 year data. So you can't really compare those, but you know, it's like that with anything new. I yeah. think that's the, the, the indication for these um, in, in our practice um, has been the patients that maybe have these sensitivities to alloys in titanium, um, the alloy that is titanium. And then 
Um, and then the aesthetic patient and the ones that I've completed cases on with uh, my surgeon here in my town. The interesting thing that I've found as far as how that they are being marketed uh, by companies is this lifetime guarantee. Now, that's that's super nice. I really appreciate whenever a company does that to back a product that if you have a problem, a failure, especially on things that maybe doesn't have that long-term 10, 15, 20-year track, track record like some of our implant, titanium implants do, you know, from way back when, um, at least some iteration of some type of implant we're using in titanium is being used now, and it's very successful. However, whenever our surgeons place these, I hear a lot of this, that the patient comes to me and says, hey, we know that this is, uh, the expectation is that this could fail, and if it does, my surgeon has um, agreed to do it again, right, at certain, you know, uh, lower cost, let's say. And I, I think that um, that's a great way to help patients get into something that is expensive um, because what we're seeing here is something that is very, very expensive. Uh, for the patients uh, to get into, and mm -hmm. it's reserved for very special situations. And is that why, right, we're seeing a real problem with adop adoption in the United States? Now, in Europe, we might be seeing a greater adoption. Speak to the adoption. Why are we having troubles? Is it the fact that we have this issue of failure rates are assumed to be a lot higher What's what's causing the adoption issues amongst our surgeons and placers? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. And I mean, I think a lot of it is, well, titanium implants are the tried and true and, and we have great success with that. So in most cases in the posterior, do we need to have a zirconia implant? I mean, I think that that's the case. And you're absolutely right. I mean, they are more expensive. And so we have to charge more. And, you know, the, the theme of our meeting is we want every patient and every practitioner to be able to be involved in implant dentistry. And so in cases where we're making it more expensive and then we have restrictions and maybe we haven't, we don't have as long-term studies, then that makes it a little bit harder. But I will say that a lot of the times, other than the patients obviously that come in and ask about it and, um, and have these potential sensitivities, I've also used it quite a few times in patients where I've had titanium implant failures where I just cannot identify a reason why. Mm. And, you know, mm. there was no medical reason, there was no surgical reason, there was, it wasn't, you know, loaded inadvertently, there wasn't anything that I could find. And, you know, why did they have this poor reaction and then this failure? And so when yeah. I, instead of just doing another titanium implant again, then I've done the zirconia implants in those cases and, you know, knock on wood, the outcome has been, has been better. And so I don't know if that's why maybe that particular uh, patient had some kind of reaction. John, you know, we heard um, one of our favorite speakers, right, talk about this idea that, well, osteointegration really isn't integration at all, right? Or is right. it this right balance of yeah, acceptance rejection and rejection and acceptance discussion. right yeah, yeah. Right, and right. so i wonder right this is a whole whole we could go down um <laughs> and and i but love I that, that the, i think the idea though that I'll, I'll be interested to see you know when we can do more especially mm. i feel like with customized abutments you know i think that's yes. still something that we're not seeing you know there's still this kind of square connection in a lot of these it's not the, quite the same internal connection we're used to you know there's been so much what do you, whatever you want to call it, nitpicking over who has the best connection <laughs> and what is the best connection and how much does that matter? Or is it just surgical placement and, you know, link of vicious and soft tissue thickness or whatever it is, you know, we could, we could debate it <clears throat> for, for hours, but you know, I think that, that with zirconia, we're focused more on, okay, we have to have a certain type of connection because of strength and we have to have yeah. a certain thickness. And so that limits us a little bit in our customization. It limits us a little bit in our connection design from a standpoint of so much tightness as it is, well, does the biocompatibility of zirconia overcome the difference in connection? And I think that that's where, you know, but then I hear you say, you know, just from a day-to-day a, a -day standpoint, from, from your own experience empirically, that you see some, 
some successes in failed sites, which has kind of been a, a real bugaboo for a lot of surgeons mm -hmm. is especially, you know, in say failed anodontic treatment sites where there seems to be an issue sometimes mm -hmm. of repeated failures, even after, uh, you know, multiple placements, could zirconia be part of the, of the, you know, the, the success, increasing success rates in these, in these compromised sites that, that makes us think differently. And I think that's how, mm -hmm. right. It's how it all starts, right? It starts with, you know, seeing some clinical case successes, trying something, seeing the success. And then I guess there, there's probably a study in there somewhere, Dr. Aglu, isn't there? There has to be a study in it. <laughs> yeah. You know, and it's funny because you're exactly right. I mean, I had a couple of patients where implants failed like two or three times, you know, once by someone else. Then I said, oh, I'm sure that I can do better. Right. And then it fails by me. And then I'm like, oh my gosh, um, you know, are we going to just do it again? The same thing? What can I do differently? And so I said, well, now we have these other implant, this other implant type of material, maybe we could do that. But, you know, you have to know that you've already failed twice. And so I can't guarantee. And they said, oh, I'm, I'm desperate. I want to do it. And when you have a success in cases like that, you know, you've already tried it on your most challenging. And so that it makes it a little easier to do it on someone who's only failed once. And uh, especially when you don't have a reason, if you say, okay, well, the site maybe was still infected or, you know, mm -hmm. they were smoking or their diabetes was control or whatever. But if you just, if you don't have a reason and, um, you know, and you, and the patient's willing to try, I mean, fortunately, most of the time, if implants fail, it's not a disastrous failure. If it's one single implant. I mean, it can be, of course, if it affects adjacent teeth and implants or, or if it's a full arch case or something, but on the majority of the single cases, if it fails and it just, you know, loses integration or doesn't integrate from the beginning, then you can, you know, take it out and, and graft and basically start over as if it were a tooth. And so in those cases, it doesn't really make me too concerned to to really start over and and think about what can we do differently and i think in you know in the area in the era of all the peri implantitis too we're really looking for mm. you know mm. how can we have materials mm. that even though titanium is super compatible maybe we want something that's even more compatible or yeah. are we thinking about some kind of soft tissue seal and you know, there are just a lot of things right now, I think, where we're looking for something different to answer some of the problems that we have. What's great about the Academy of Osseo Integration is we have people that are studying, presenting content uh, just like you're hearing right here. And, and you know what? This is what I get excited about because we get to hear some of the most innovative uh, people on the planet in regards to restoring and placing dental implants. And yep. I would and like we have to new products, right, all the time. Yeah, new products that are, that all are, the time. That are going to be, you know, tip, the AO has become a place where you can go and you can not only hear the, the clinical aspects and the and the 15 years or 30 or f mm. sometimes 50 years of research that's presented by some of these esteemed presenters, but you can also hear about the newest products that are being released. Uh, sometimes the AO is used many times as the place to release your new product into the U.S. market or sometimes into the world market. And, and so, I, so that's something that I'm interested to see. What, what I'm wondering, John year. and Dr. Agalu, is if um, this year is the year that we might see something new. Um, in the realm of zirconia, let's talk about that. That's kind of the highlight of our conversation here. Are you excited about someone that's going to be speaking on innovations in zirconia? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, one of one of my closest colleagues here, Jawan P. and friends is going to talk. I think he has a roundtable or a small discussion about zirconia implants. And, you know, he's the one that kind of got me excited about it. And uh, and so I, I think that there are going to be some innovations there. I think another area of innovation that we're going to see at the AO is digital. I mean, that is changing all the mm. time. I mean, from the workflow to the guides to, you know, the prosthesis fabrication, both, you know, abutment to crown temporary versus permanent. I mean, there's so much in, in that right now. So I think that, um, you know, we're going to, I'm sure we're going to hear about AI and, and how that's used more in implant dentistry. So I think there's going to be a lot of new stuff, especially because like you said at the beginning of the show, 
even though we haven't been together, it doesn't mean that people aren't working on their own or, you know, researching in their labs or, or generating and innovating in the, in the industry setting and, um, and then innovating in, in their offices because we had more time to think actually. So, you know, usually I think we're so busy with our lives and we're just doing and, and maybe even sometimes kind of just like machines going through the motions, but we actually had more time to think during COVID. And, and I think that, that that thinking time makes us innovate and um, and develop new questions and and products and methodology and technology so i'm i'm excited about that and to see what people have been thinking about and have them actually show us and talk to us about it february 24th and 26th in 2022 we'll be in san diego the question is will you be right (laughs) i'm excited so much about the Academy of Osseo Integration meeting. Hey, listen, this is going to be the meeting you don't want to miss because I yep. really feel like that it's just going to kick things back off. John, you talked about it kind of kicking back off us doing in-meeting coverage, and we're super pumped about that from from a standpoint of you and I and just diving back in. I know from the passion that I hear it in Dr. Agalu's that voices that she's excited as the president to launch back in. Give us a little send off, like tell us what, you know, what's ahead. Some of the things, the meeting venues are amazing. As you mentioned in, in our intro, we're excited about that. And then John, you can close it. Yeah, I mean, you know, I told you a bit about what to expect in terms of scientific and and clinical pearls and and the um, corporate forums. Of course, we're going to see new cool stuff from all the um, all of industry. But the social events are also going to be great. I mean, we're going to have the gala on the USS Midway, and you know, we did a, a tour there a few months ago and and went there to see the venue. And the port in San Diego is so beautiful, and you know, the weather is almost always perfect. I should probably knock on wood when I say that um, Mm -hmm. in San Diego. But um, really, I mean, to be on the deck of that of that ship and um, to be able to to host a party there and and have an event and and, you know, with food and drinks and, and colleagues and stuff, I mean, it's going to be it's going to be so fun. And so I, I really think that everyone's going to really love it. You know, always our events, um, our president's event is included in the, you know, in the fee of the meeting. So everybody's invited. Everybody's welcome and encouraged to to come. And, you know, I want to I want to say hi to everyone, you know, whether we're going to hug or fist bump or elbow tap or whatever it is that, you know, or wave high from a distance or whatever everyone's comfortable with. I mean, San Diego is, is the, is just such a place to be. I mean, I think that, you know, we've kind of opened things up a little slower in California, but the, the good thing about that is that I, I think once they're open, they're open. And so, you know, I, I really feel like things are just going to continue to get better and better. And, you know, all of the, um, all of the protocols that are in place and the, you know, open air um, location and, uh, and stuff and, and the weather at that time of year here where it's, you know, usually much colder almost everywhere else. So uh, I think people will be really excited to come. Yeah. Well, that's a, that's, that's a lot of good stuff and a lot of good stuff. And, you know, I think that uh, I almost feel that this is like the first AO meeting right now. You know, it's like, it's, it sounds strange, but it's like my, I feel like it's kind of the way I felt about going to my first AO meeting years and years ago. It was like, it, you know, because I do feel like you alluded to this earlier. There's been a little bit of stagnation. I mean, let's just mm-hmm. be honest. There's been a little bit of stagnation in our profession, personally, professionally. There's just been just this, this, okay, everybody's kind of drawn inward a little bit. And kind of just put our head down, just get through 2020 and a little bit of 2021. And I think, you know, with how busy most of us are, you know, it, it's time to say, okay, what can we take from there's a huge demand for dentistry right now in most places. Um, so how do we make sure that we are picking back up after maybe two years of not changing anything or very little? I don't know. Maybe you have, maybe you haven't, but I think a lot of us have been a little bit and just kind of, okay, do the same thing. Let's get through this time. Now it's time to really evaluate where you are, come here, get some excitement in your life. That's how I felt at my first meeting. It was like, I'm not really sure what I'm going to learn. Probably a lot of things I won't know, but that's what you, where you want to be just enough where you go, okay, I'm doing some things right, but let me be challenged. 
and then let's go and let's have a drink on the midway deck Oh my. And in the beautiful San Diego weather, oh and let's talk about life, and let's sh- swap some cool stories about what's going on in our practices, and let's kind of reconnect with humanity here and with our colleagues, and I think you know be ready to push the profession forward for the next you know several years down the road as we kind of go into sort of this reopening of of you know the exciting place we are. So, thank you so much for being. Thank you, with Dr. Us, Dr. Aglu. Aglu. It's been awesome. And, uh, and we are super excited for, uh, thank you for your leadership for AO and kind of where mm-hmm. you're, where you're taking it. Uh, thank you to Academy of Austin Immigration for, uh, giving us the opportunity to have you on the show and also to work together, uh, with the Academy in, uh, covering some of the meeting and kind of trying to, to encourage people to, to make sure that they're coming out and, and being a part of this, being a part of the organization. Uh, we look forward to seeing you there. We'll, uh, yeah, very least fist bump, if not hug, for sure. I mean, come on, it's it's time. We need everybody needs a little hug. I think right now. I'm ready to hug. Are, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's. I mean, come on. Let's 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 time for that. It's definitely time for that. So we're excited. Uh, if you haven't signed up for the meeting, head over head over to osteo.org and check out what they have to offer. Sign up for this meeting while you can still save a little bit by signing up early. We've still got some time ahead of us to really get this kicked off right. So get signed up for the meeting. If you haven't checked out the Dental Guys, make sure you do that. Go to dentalguys.net. Check out what we have going on. Check us out on all the social media outlets. Uh, we are everywhere on those. Tell us what you liked about what we're bringing to you. If, you're prov- if we're providing some useful content for you, make sure you give us a five-star rating in Apple Podcasts. We thank you so much for that. Thank you once again to the Academy of Us Integration. Get signed up. Check it out. For Dr. Agalu, for Wes, I'm John, and we are the Dental Guys.